you're a startup, you just have to survive. If you think that this is <laughs> gonna work, just do it and then like ask questions later. Was it exactly what you thought it was gonna be when you were actually getting into it? Tried to build AI, realized it was incredibly challenging and then realized there needed to be platforms and infrastructure that powered the next generation of artificial intelligence tools. So you go through YC, demo day happens. How was it since then? One of the since things we did in Ukraine, for example, is we built algorithms that could detect damage in civilian structures. So if you had to sum up maybe the current state of affairs between US versus China and AI, what would that look like? I believe in America and its institutions. The one and only Alex. Hello everyone, welcome to another exciting episode with Arthi and <laughs> Sriram. Uh, and today we have somebody who's been a dear friend for a long time. And I always wanted to get him on the show and we finally managed to make it happen. And, uh, and you, know, if, you know, if you've been following the world of AI, for startups in the last couple of years. He is no stranger. Um, and he's also kind of one of the most thoughtful founders and CEOs about not just technology, but company building, structured thinking, risk taking that uh, I've seen. And he's delighted this is going to be super fun. Uh, the one and only Alexander Wang of uh, Scale.ai. Alex, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I, uh, I'm so excited to be here. You guys are such great uh, such great hosts, so uh, thank you so much for having me. Well, we'll see after the end of this hour how we feel about that. We'll, we'll check back <laughs> in on that. Um, but maybe, you know, let's just start with the basics, right? Like, tell uh, us a little bit about your backstory, um, where did you grow up, how did you get into all things AI? Yeah, so um, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, which is where the atomic bomb was first built, and there's still... Sort of the, the main employer of this town is still this large research laboratory uh, that my both my parents actually worked at. Um, and so everyone I knew growing up was either uh, was either the, the child of some sort of scientist or a scientist uh, themselves. And so it was sort of uh, this very you know special and, and inspiring place to grow up. Um, one of the you know one of the lessons that you learn growing up in this place, um, since the history of the town is that you know, in the 40s, they brought together all the most brilliant scientists in the world in across the United States, many of whom were immigrants, um, had them work on this this grand challenge of, of the Manhattan Project. And and the building of the atomic bomb obviously um, had had huge implications for geopolitics and and frankly, the entire like the whole world over the course of the, you know, from then until now, basically. And mm. um, it was it was a really striking history to sort of grow up in because you sort of recognize the the importance and the sort of potential impact of technology on the the world writ large and i think we're seeing a lot of that today and and i think it's um it's you know this is some of the stuff that i think is most interesting um so i grew up there uh and then um and then i went to uh i went to school at mit um when, when growing up i sort of fell in love with first it was math um and then i realized computer science was kind of just applied math but you could get these you know computers to do crazy things, um, and when I was at MIT, I was sort of excited about the craziest things that computers could do, which is all around uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So this was you know was in school the year when um, uh, DeepMind released AlphaGo, which was sort yeah. of one of the yeah one of the early. This was in 2015. Um, it was sort of one of the first whoa moments of of uh, artificial intelligence. And um, and so I was studying it myself at school, and I wanted to build this side project of putting a camera inside my refrigerator that would tell me when my roommates were uh, stealing my food. And that is uh, the most well, it's one of the most <laughs> MIT esque things I've heard in recent times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, unfortunately it was very hard to build. It, it I didn't manage to get the prototype working. But in Wait, that process, so what does it do? It basically just uh, it, it's, a, it's a live running camera inside your refrigerator that tracks people opening the fridge door and taking food. Yes, exactly. So so the parts. Of, so, yes, I got the camera running. It was in the it was in the fridge. It would it was observing the sort of fridge layout. Um, but uh, it was this exact detecting when somebody was going to grab uh, an item and what items they grabbed. That was like the hardest thing because there's all sorts of different <laughs> items in the fridge and and so anyway, I got I have all the footage. Uh, I just wow. I don't I don't have the AI to tell me when when the <laughs> yeah the, 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 the legality of this is a bit questionable. I think right like uh, but I I want to ask you about MIT because a lot of folks uh, listening to this are young may dream of going to MIT or you know are curious. Did you what would people have not been there not understand about the culture that you know, that exists, which might have actually set you on the path to where you are now. 
it's a total hacker culture. And I think this is, you know, it's, it's, it's underappreciated. I think MIT obviously is such an incredible institution and, um, and, uh, and has, you know, such a great reputation, but, um, but everyone at MIT is some sort of hacker. You know, people are, uh, you know, th there's actually a thing called hacking uh, on MIT campus where you, uh, where you go around and you sort of go places in the buildings where you're not supposed to go and you get on roofs that you're not supposed to go to, et cetera. But, but it's sort of a, you know, I, I shouldn't, you know, in some ways it's irreverent, but very engineering focused. Sort of like everybody's building something on campus. You know, the, there's some people who are building these catapults on the lawn and there's other people who are building like, uh, you know, uh, little apps for all their friends to use. And there's other people who are like building crazy LED displays in their in their rooms. And so it's a very, you know, building focused hacker, you know, tinkering kind of culture, uh, mm -hmm. much more so than, than an academic culture or sort of like, you know, research oriented culture, which is, uh, which I found incredibly inspiring. You know, it's really, you know, it's incredible to be in an environment where almost everyone around you is, is building something or doing something from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. sort of get this sort of like electric energy from just being in um being in the presence yeah. of people. Go back to the refrigerator. I'm so curious to see what happened there. Sure, I'm just cut you off. Yeah, well so 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 uh built this refrigerator or built this camera inside of the refrigerator and uh and then I realized firsthand how difficult it was to actually build uh AI and machine learning use cases. Yeah. Um yeah. And uh, one of the first problems uh, you run into is data and data sets. Like, where are you going to get all the data? How do you build mm -hmm. these high quality data sets? And this, you know, this has continued to be a problem even until now. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But that was sort of the, you know, it was really this sort of like almost this classic start moment where I, I tried to build AI, realized it was incredibly challenging, very, very difficult, and then realized there needed to be platforms and infrastructure that, that powered the next generation of artificial intelligence tools. And, you know, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that, that at scale we've said since the very early days is this play on um, something that, you know, another one of your guests, uh, Mark Andreessen said, you know, Mark, Mark says uh, software is eating the world. And, and we say, uh, if software is eating the world, then AI is eating software. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, you know, I think this is like very visceral right now. You can see it happening before your eyes with all these generative AI apps and, mm -hmm. and uh, like mid journey and stable diffusion and such. But I fundamentally believe, and we fundamentally have believed this whole time that AI was going to be this massive wave that was slowly going to encompass almost everything that we touched and every, everything that we did. And we needed to build the platforms to enable that. And so okay. that was back in 2016, started the company. Um, I was 19 when I started the company. Uh, and then, uh, and then here we are six years later. And then when you started the company, when you started Scale, what, you know, you talked about the problems that you wanted to solve, but how was, how was it to just start a company? You know, you first time founder, what was the whole scenario just getting into like entrepreneurship as such? Because everyone talks about it, but what, you know, was it exactly what you thought it was going to be when you were actually getting into it? So, yeah, this is, this is interesting. I think, um, well, I think the first thing I was lucky, I, 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 uh, we did Y Combinator and that was sort yeah. of like, you know, the first moment of, of, of company building were like, was, it was as a part of the Y Combinator program, which is, which yeah. is very, very lucky. Cause they really, um, they set you up with the right philosophies, the right beliefs, like the right way to think about building a company and moving quickly. And then, um, you know, I, I was a huge fan of Paul Graham's essays. Um, mm. and I, I'd been reading them even when I was in, um, when I was in college and he, is obviously incredibly brilliant and, and an incredible writer, but also kind of like sets you up with the right way to think about building a company. And, and the core, you know, the core of it really is, you know, Hey, we, you, you have to like move extremely quickly. You know, your advantage as a startup is speed versus, versus a lot of other big companies. Um, it really, you have to build things that people want, uh, you know, and you have to be very honest with yourself on whether or not people want your product. Um, and these were sort of the core principles, but it was incredibly, um, uh, I don't know if scary is the right word, but it was, there was a lot of uncertainty. It was sort of like really unclear what's going to happen. You know, one of the, one of the, like not talked about things is that in all these batches of Y Combinator, you have all these people who are like brilliant and, and going after it, yeah, but then yeah. most of the companies die. And yeah. so, um, and they die kind of, you know, nobody just, nobody talk nobody addresses that fact and talks about it, but it was sort of. It was very, um, 
it was really it was really uncertain. I know you went through Y Combinator as well. I, I um, did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very similar experience, right? Like for me also, like going through the whole program and I think similar to you, through the YC program, my company was very new. And there were a few other companies in the batch who had had like some level of just like they'd been around a little bit, they're more mature, had a little bit of product market fit science. We didn't we're very early. And I remember sitting around and looking at them going, wow, like how, how, you know, how, why are we in this batch? This is like the worst company of the entire batch. Like we just don't deserve to be here. And it's very hard to not feel intimidated looking at like people around you. Um, but also it was like a great place to find support because everyone is just as kind of nutty as you are and just trying to like do these things. And, and, you know, mine was the last batch where PG was uh, involved in. And so the yeah. Tuesday dinners were fantastic. You know, he would like basically stand around like him and Jessica and like serve burritos and stuff. And it was just like really fun to hang out with this cohort mm -hmm. of people. So I love the YC yeah. experience. Very um, learned a lot on just foundational um, ethics of building a company, I guess you could call it that. And just the discipline of like finding product market fit fundraising, all the things that I didn't want to do. Like fundraising was like the thing that I just did not enjoy doing. And it was just like, YC just gave me a process to think about it. By the way, I think just side note, one thing I remember from that is it's not apparent which companies are going to make it. Oh yeah. Because, uh, you know, there are a lot of great companies that are considered hot in her batch, but her batch also had Tony and DoorDash. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and like DoorDash, um, I mean, for, first of all, DoorDash, I don't know about like whether we thought they would be successful at that time. It wasn't quite clear, but they were the nicest people in the batch. And uh, it was just hard to not root for them. And they were solving this like really tedious, insane problem of like food delivery in suburban neighborhoods, which was considered completely unsexy, uh, but just really nice founders, really great people to uh, hang out with. And they were in our like YC circle too. The office hour circle. So that was really good. Yeah. It's similar, yeah. like good experience going through YC. Okay. So you go through YC, demo day happens. Um, yes. how, how was it since then? Demo day happens. And then, you know, I, I certainly felt this way. I, I don't know if you agree, but it, it felt like you're just thrown into the deep end and you're kind of like, you know, <laughs> when you're in YC, you have all this like structure and like, you know, you have, you have like, it, you know, it, it, you have all this, this like process and infrastructure. Sort of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Infrastructure around you. And then, you you go and then you go off and you realize like wow you're you're kind of you're kind of um on it uh, on your own and yeah. um and yeah so it was it was really um it was really uh i remember feeling uh, I, I don't know if the word is lost but just sort of like you know it was sort of like it was it was hard to know exactly you know maybe the toughest thing in in any sort of entrepreneurial journey is knowing whether or not you're doing the right things mm -hmm. and um and it's so hard to get any sort of signal on whether or not you're doing the right things. The only signals you really have are like, you know, are you able to hire great people? Are you able to bring on great customers? You know, you know, the, the, in some sense, that's, that's about it. Those two things are about it. Um, and so I remember it was, it was, um, it was kind of uncertain for some time and, uh, and it was actually really tough to recruit people in the very early days uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, you know, I was, I was like a college dropout and I was just trying to like, at first I was just convincing my friends. I was like going, going to my, my friends from school out of my team. I was like, Hey, you know, you guys, you guys should maybe just drop out too. And we should all just <laughs> do yeah. this. Thing. Yeah. And by the way, I've deleted all the footage I took of you stealing food. So just FYI. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, and so, so the first few years, I think were like almost like classic startup. It was just, yeah. um, you know, we're hacking and building and it, it was um, we were we were um, we were just trying to get products that got out there. You know, we were building an API. The core project at that time was an API. So we're just trying to get developers to use our API to help build their um, machine learning applications. And then we had a bunch of early customers um, who or we had one early customer in particular who is a uh, autonomous vehicle company. And uh, they they integrated the API. They were really excited about it. And then they just started blowing up like that that one customer started just um you know they grew and they grew and they grew and they grew and we were just sort of keeping up with them and trying to um trying to like make them feel like they could they could rely on us and depend on us and that was sort of those were some of the first moments where it felt like oh things were actually clicking 
And the, the early phase of the company, um, the, one of the best things we ever did was just focus full heartedly on autonomous vehicles, you know, for the first, up until like 2019. So the first three years of the company, um, we basically were, you know, scale was like synonymous with data for autonomous vehicles. Um, and that focus was, was really, really critical because it, it, you know, when we first decided to focus on it, it felt like a small problem. Um, and it felt like something that wouldn't be big enough to support the sort of like level of ambition of the company. But at a micro level, we knew that the customers were there. We knew that they had a lot of pain and we knew we could solve their problems. Um, and, and I remember thinking, at, at, you know, um, at one point I was getting advice on this topic. It's like, hey, should we focus on this or should we be broader? How do you think about that? And I remember the sort of um, the advice that I got. Uh, some people were like, oh, no, that's like such a small problem. That, that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. And then there was, there was like um, a few people in particular, if I remember, who were just like, you're a startup. You just have to survive. If you think that this is going to work, just do it. And then like ask questions later. And then three years later, you know, we sort of, um, we, uh, we managed to grow quite a lot just off this initial use case. And then that really was sort of the springboard that allowed us to, to build up the kind of rest of our rest of our ambitions and the rest of our business. Okay. So if you had to disc, what does scale do today? How would you describe it? Yeah. So today scale provides products and infrastructure to support, uh, every company being able to do AI and machine learning. And so we work with many, many large enterprises. We work with the government very closely. Uh, and it's all around taking this sort of black magic technology of artificial intelligence and making it very, very practically useful across a wide variety of verticals. So I mentioned our, our original work in autonomous vehicles and automotive. You know, There we work with companies like General Motors or Toyota mm-hmm. um, and, and many of the largest automakers in the world. You know, in our, in our work with um, the government, uh, we work particularly on national security problems. Uh, I can talk about a bit about this uh, later, but I, I think it's absolutely critical that we have in the United States access to the best AI technology for national security. And so some of the things that we've worked on there are um, around geospatial intelligence and utilizing um, all the imagery that we have to basically enable a, a greater uh, national security. So one of the Thank things we did in Ukraine, for example, is we built algorithms that could detect damage in civilian structures uh, mm-hmm. across all the cities in Ukraine. So we did this across um, Kiev and Kharkiv, Dnipro, Mariupol, all the major cities. Uh, and there's algorithms that can detect real time when there's damage on very civilian structures. And you can use that to coordinate humanitarian mm-hmm. response and sort of um, defense responses. Um, so, yeah, so that's cool. We recently had Palmer Lucky on the podcast. And you know this is something we talked about. And I think there's kind of this theme of... Uh, you know, how does technology, how does the technology industry work with government? And we talked about maybe there's a change in opinion. Like when he started uh, Angel, it was not popular. In fact, there were like protests inside Google uh, about like Google working with the government. Now, of course, this year, you know, with what's been happening in Ukraine, I think that tone has shifted. Hmm. Kind of curious to get your take on the state of AI in national defense. And what do you think the tech and what do you think the tech industry should do when it comes to working with the folks in DC and the Pentagon? Yeah. Well, so I think the first thing to just acknowledge is that the the tech stack for defense has totally changed or, mm-hmm. or needs to totally change. You know, if you if you think about um, a lot of what the United States has been investing in from a national security perspective, it's a lot of like basically giant hardware systems. It's more um, F-35s and fighter planes or more aircraft carriers and more submarines and, you know, all these like giant pieces of, of infrastructure, which are, you know, maybe would have been important 50 years ago. But now you look at what's happening in Ukraine and it's all about drones. It's all about greater, better intelligence, which is mostly mm-hmm. digital. It's like mm-hmm. cyber cyber uh, security and and uh, and being able to use different signals to to get better intelligence. It's all about um, missiles uh, and missile defense. And and, you know, you can even see it like the the uh, the the tanks that the Russians had were basically useless um, in, mm-hmm. in a lot of the conflict. And so the, there's sort of this, um, we're at this moment, it's a really, really important moment. And I think I agree with 100% with, with Palmer that um, we're at this moment where the whole tech stack needs to change. And it's so critical that, you know, there's technology experts and that the tech community on the whole realizes that this is, this is what's happening and that, you know, the wars of the next 50 years 
are going to be fought on totally new tech platforms that in the United States really have not been built yet. So it's a it's a massive moment to build. And I know that, you know, and and um, and I think that there's a bunch of technologies that become really important. Autonomous systems are really important. Drones are really important. Um, and AI is a critical technology that underpins you know, many of these components. AI can be used for cyber warfare and cybersecurity. AI can be used for disinformation. AI can be used for um, better drone and drone autonomy. AI can be used in, in all these different use cases that are critical for the next, um, the next generation of conflict. And, right. and, you know, not to like belabor the, the sort of point, I think at this point, many of us are tired of hearing about US versus China, but, mm-hmm. you know, the reason this all matters is if you think about, the, if you think about what happened after the, atomic bomb in the 19 after World War II, you know, um, the fact that the United States was the clear superpower in the world created, Mm -hmm. you know, decades and decades of peace that were virtually unprecedented. If you look at the history of humanity before the sort of past, you know, uh, call it 80 years or 100 years, it's defined by war. And so Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact that the United States had the best technology and was a superpower has been critical to this period where, you know, frankly, there's been so much progress in humanity and, and these huge economies have developed. And we're in this, we're in this incredible period of, of, of great innovation, but all of that can go away if we don't have, you know, if we don't have the level of security that we have today. And so it's, it's one of these things that, you know, it, it doesn't, it's hard to feel on a micro level, which is one of the yeah. reasons why I think it's, it feels very intangible to most yeah. people. But definitely, if we end up in a in a regime where, let's say, you know, God forbid, China has overtaken the United States and China yeah. has built that tech stack more quickly and more efficaciously than than we have in America, then we have a lot of very big problems. Mm. Um, how would you sum up? Uh, so it's interesting. What a what, lot of what you said, you know, if you read like if I think you do like the Peter Zihans of the world, mm. they would probably say for the last. 50, 60 years, we, you know, we had a bunch of aircraft carriers and we projected naval power and superiority and basically, you know, enforce the peace, right? Or at least, you know, and, and that now the world has changed and politically and technologically. Um, how would you sum up the current state of AI if the US and China were involved in a conflict? Because one of the things I think about is on the Chinese side, which I'm much less familiar with, is that A is, uh, they haven't been encumbered by the technology industry there, not wanting to work with government, which I think has been a theme here. Second is we have a lot more thinking work around AI ethics, uh, how AI should be used, which my sense is doesn't really exist there. For example, look at like the use of you know face detection, et cetera. So if you had to sum up maybe the current state of affairs between US with China and AI, what would that look like? Yeah, totally. So I think the first thing to, to just acknowledge and get out there is that the vast majority of innovation in AI over the past 10 years has occurred inside the United States. So, you know, um, the United States really is the place where AI has been born, AI has progressed, AI has been, has flourished, and it's American companies that have led a lot of this innovation, which is, I think, incredibly good and incredibly um, exciting as, a, as an American. Um, that being said, to your point, the sort of the taking this technology and then applying it to you know, government problem sets has happened much faster in China than the United mm-hmm. States. Um, and you can see this, you know, the most prominent example in China is uh, facial detection for Uyghurs. And there's, you know, a whole industry of, of Chinese tech companies with very, very strong uh, machine learning teams. You know, if you look at the leaderboards of most of the computer vision competitions, research competitions, it's uh, these Chinese companies that are at the top of that. And so they're very capable and they've built this technology to suppress Uyghurs in China. And that's mm-hmm. happened. Um, and, and that exists over there. At the same time, we don't have that kind of, we don't have the best and brightest AI minds in the United States working on national security problems. Now, our problems are different. We wouldn't work on Uyghur suppression. But uh, again, there's sort of this, um, we've, we've fallen behind in that way. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the things that you mentioned are really, really important. You know, We have to build AI with democratic values. And mm-hmm. It's true, China is unencumbered from that, from that perspective, but it's critical that in the United States that we do that. Um, and uh, I actually don't think that that's a major hindrance, uh, either now or in the long run, because the, the reality is 
if you build technology in these authoritarian regimes, eventually the innovation just stops and you're just mm-hmm. unable to, to, to do more. So I think, I think we need to embrace democracy as a, um, as a clear mm-hmm. advantage uh, of our system. But I think the last piece is, is the sort of like collaboration between the tech ecosystem and, and the national security eco- ecosystem is incredibly weak. And I think it's, it's both mm-hmm. parties' fault. Or it's, you know, um, the government has, has arcane procurement rules. People um, don't really trust the tech companies. And, and as a result, they haven't, you know, there's not, they are, they're continuing to spend hundreds of billions of dollars with traditional mm-hmm. defense contractors mm-hmm. rather than realizing that they need to integrate more of the technology that's been built in the, within the tech ecosystem. And at the same time, in the tech ecosystem, you know, a lot of the most uh, sophisticated and advanced companies don't work with, don't want to work on national security problems because um, the the employees who are who are building a lot of this AI um, would would quit those companies if that happened. And you know, right. it's a very strange, you know, it's a weird um, spot for us to be as a country. But that is kind of the reality. Even if you read, you know, for example, if you read. Um, OpenAI's terms of service uh, yeah. for for their APIs, they don't allow you to use uh, you know their their APIs for national security, which is is a very strange position to be. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Like, why is it so controversial within these tech companies? You know, we OpenAI was an example that you pointed out, but you look at these big companies like Google, where you know employees will petition against uh, Google working with a DoD. Why? I mean, simple questions. Why is it so controversial within the tech industry? You know, I really think it's it's about geopolitical uh, training and education, frankly. Right. And, I, and you know, I think one of the things that, um, you know, uh, one of the things that, that I think a lot of technologists don't understand is when the technology is invented, it's being used by bad guys mm-hmm. almost immediately. And so I think there's there's this naivete among amongst a lot of the people building this technology um, where, you know, they've invented the technology and maybe they believe, hey, if if we don't use it for bad things, then nobody's going to use it for bad things. And you can sort of gatekeep the technology that way. And that's just not realistic. You know, you look at um, like, you know, the development of large language models, for example, Mm -hmm. as soon as this technology came out, Russia and China both started labs to replicate this technology for uh, the creation of disinformation uh, globally. And, and, you know, so it's, I think it's, it's this world where, you know, we don't, we, we're not pragmatic enough as a tech industry to, to understand and realize that the bad guys are using this technology, whether we like it or not. And either Mm -hmm. we as the good guys can also use the technology and fight back, or we're just handicapping ourselves for the next decades. Yeah. Um, I want to get into the technology a bit, but when we had Imad Mostak of uh, you know stability on our show, one of the things he pointed out was he said it was very presumptuous for a few set of people in Silicon Valley to basically say these are the ethics and values through which you can use technology for all of mankind. For all of mankind, um, you know, a to your point, it doesn't work that way because the bad, well, not I don't want to say the bad guys, but other sets of people definitely build their own vari- variants. The second is you know the people who I think are well-intentioned and amazing and smart only represent one set of ethics, values, morality, um, and there's a lot of others which uh, could be equally justifiable. So I, I, that part uh, resonated with me. Okay, I want to get to the technology because I think there's a lot of interesting things we can do there, but maybe as a start, and this is going to be one of these simple questions, which maybe have a tough answer. We, we're recording this in November 2022. Sum up for us the current state of AI, because it has been the year of LLMs, it has been the year of mid-journey, stable diffusion, uh, Just Dali, generative AI just yeah, taking gen- over. All of generative AI, you know, um, you know, everyone's gotten familiar with prompt engineering and, you know, uh, created some digital art or two, but you've been in the midst of it. What is the current state of the union? Yeah. So, so first I want to take a step back, which is that AI as a field is really it's really interesting and exciting because it always, um, you know, if you zoom all the way out, it looks like this exponential curve. But then if you look more deeply, it's kind of this like curve where you get a breakthrough and then you plateau a bit and you get a breakthrough and you plateau and then you get another breakthrough. And so it's, and, and then the breakthroughs are happening faster and faster, but it's sort of, um, it's a story of 
of, of multiple breakthroughs. The most, so the, the initial breakthrough might have been just convolutional neural nets in the first place, which was, um, you know, I think it was 2012 or 2013 is when AlexNet, which is the first application of, of deep learning and deep neural networks to... Wait, hold on. I'm going to say the original breakthrough was John McCarthy and Lisp way back in the <laughs> 60s, okay? Like, it is, you're going really OG, but sorry, yeah, you are right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'll tell the brief the brief history of, of deep learning. By the way, deep learning did was was a technology that people were thinking about long before then. But this was like the first time it it just beat everything. And then mm-hmm. um and and it was this incredible time where where it's sort of like the initial phase of deep learning. And then we had um you know the the AlphaGo breakthrough and reinforcement deep reinforcement learning um became this incredible breakthrough in, in the overall technology. Then we had GANs. Which is sort of the precursor to a lot of the image generation stuff that we have today, which mm-hmm. is uh, which we'll definitely talk about. Um, and then, uh, and then most recently, the sort of transformer um, has mm-hmm. been this uh, has been this huge breakthrough, which has led to a lot of what we see today. Um, and uh, and I think that the recent so it's important to walk through this trend because the, there's sort of under there's undercurrents that power all of this. The mm-hmm. undercurrents that power everything in AI are the compute, the data, and the algorithms. Um, compute has continued to just get better and better and better and better. Moore's law continues. Um, in particular, the GPUs keep getting better and better. You know, NVIDIA has done incredible work in building this yep. platform that powers all of AI. And, um, and uh, that, is, that has been a huge accelerant for everything that's, that's happening in AI. Data is another undercurrent. Um, you know, frankly, this is a, a, one of the incredible things that the internet has given us is that because the internet is constantly accumulating more and more and more data um, uh, every single day, all this data is being fed into these algorithms and enabling these algorithms to accomplish just incredible things. And then we've continued to improve on the algorithm side. And then, okay, so now where are we today? We're at a point where I think um, I think we're, we're starting to see AI do some pretty magical things. So if you mm-hmm. look at large language models or these large diffusion models, mid-journey, stable diffusion, Dolly 2, et cetera. Um, look at Whisper. You look at all these systems. They not only are able to understand a lot of this data. So, you know, we all, we, we, we had been at the point where we could understand images and videos and, 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 um, and uh, audio and text, et cetera. But now we can actually generate very convincing, um, uh, convincing data quite easily. You know, we have now have image generation capabilities. We have text generation capabilities. Uh, we have um, we now have video generation. Um, there's a lot of very exciting research that show these sort of very convincing short gifs um, using AI. You have audio generation, of course, which has been there. And so, one of the ways I frame this in terms of just the history of the internet is that you know, Web 1.0 was read. Web 2.0 was read and write. Um, I'm going to skip over what everyone calls web three. And then hey now, now. <laughs> <laughs> now you have um, read, write, and then computer read and computer write. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's this, it's this big, I think it's this huge moment in computing um, because now you have these systems that can, that can generate and understand in this, um, in this very scalable way. Mm-hmm. Now, the, if you talk to a lot of people in AI, a lot mm-hmm. of the hardcore AI people, this is simply one step on the road to AGI or artificial general intelligence, Mm -hmm. which, you know, um, organizations like OpenAI or DeepMind, they're all aiming towards that to get to a world where, you know, AI systems um, can do almost anything a human can do better than a human. And uh, I think it's always, you know, there's always this point of speculate, mass speculation with the community on how close are we and and Mm when we're gonna get there. Some people believe that you just take what we have today and you keep scaling it up and you're gonna get there. Um, and that could be true, um, but uh, but other people think that you need fundamentally more breakthroughs, and I think it's it's uh, that's one of the, mm-hmm. the great debates in AI. But we're we're at this incredible point, um, and uh, and I think we're at a point where finally, you know, people have talked about AI as a platform technology for so long, and I think we're finally at a point where you're actually seeing that play out, where the sort of level of innovation on top of these AI systems is mm-hmm. just is just absolutely astronomical. Mm-hmm. I want to zoom into generative AI, you know, because I think in, in some ways it's been the year of generative AI. Uh, can you just kind of get your take on what do you think the current state of generative AI is? And one tangent is it's been interesting that a lot of the 
breakthroughs or the things that seize people's imagination have come from startups and not from Google or any of the big companies, even the, you know, the Transformers paper, you know, attention is all you need, all of that, all the fundamental research often came from Google. So curious about where do you, the current state of gender AI, what is interesting and what do you think the long-term market structure, especially between startups and big tech will be? Yeah. And I think this is, this is a super interesting question. I think the first thing just on the, you know, the story of innovation, um, uh, one story of innovation is really what ends up happening is that you get these um, you get these new platforms and then uh, you just get lots of people trying stuff on top of these platforms. And, you know, most of the ideas are total crap and won't go anywhere. And then some of the ideas are really good and uh, and end up sort of being these like incredible platforms that power the next generation of, of technology. And. Um, I think what we're seeing right now in generative AI is really that, that you have these platforms of LLMs and stable diffusion um, and these sort of these these core uh, tech platforms. And you're seeing people try all sorts of stuff on top of it. And mm-hmm. there's like, you know, there's a new startup every day and or maybe five new startups every day. And half of them um, are probably not going to win, but then like some small uh, portion are going to be really successful. And I think that that, virtuous cycle of innovation is one of the reasons why a lot of the really exciting use cases you're seeing come out of startups is because big companies, they just can't try that many things. You know, big companies often actually are most of the time successful when they're very focused and they're sort of, mm-hmm. uh, they, they focus specifically on a very narrow set of things. And so this, this, this entrepreneurial component around like trying all the different ideas just doesn't in practice happen at these big companies. It doesn't in practice, it's something that's very hard for them to do. There are also, you know, these companies, like the companies in particular, like a Microsoft or a Google or a Facebook, they're also um, pretty constrained by, uh, by, by uh, regulatory concerns and sort of reputational mm-hmm. concerns and, and mm-hmm. all these things that, um, you know, you both know uh, super well. Um, and so the, the, in practice, they just don't try that much stuff. The startups try all the stuff and then, um, and then some of the startup stuff work and works in, um, it gets going. Now, I think the the real question is the long term market structure. So, I think in the short term, startups are going to innovate and build the best use cases, and those are going to gain traction. But then, the long term market structure is a huge open question, which is is um, are the big companies going to copy the startups that work uh, and uh, and basically and and capture these use cases, or do the startups have enough? run, have enough time to run to actually gain enough traction to be competitive in their own Mm -hmm. right. Um, And, uh, you know, I'll give, I'll give my opinion. I think that one of the, one of the things about the, 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 the big companies is none of them are laughing about AI. They're all taking it extremely seriously. Um, They're very focused on it. They're all, I would almost, they're all probably paranoid that AI is going to disrupt them. Um, And so I think they're going to move pretty quickly and swiftly in, in integrating into their products. And you even see this recently with um, some of the Microsoft uh, work, where they they built this uh, UI designer product, which is in, mm-hmm. which has uh, yeah. Dolly two directly integrated into it. Um, and they also built Copilot. And so I think that I think the incumbents are going to move faster than in any other space. Um, they'll move faster on AI than any other space, and that means the window for startups is is shorter than. Mm-hmm any other space. Just rewinding a bit, my theory on why the big tech companies have been slower is, I mean, look, there's always a function of, you know, big tech, politics, entrepreneurship, but I think a lot of it has been culture, which is, I think there has been so much fear around ethics, uh, usage, and, you know, um, you know, uh, people crawling, creating content, uh, which may get you into press trouble. Um, and I think, you know, uh, if you look at something like say, Stable Diffusion, they've been very bold. They're like, well, download this two gigabyte file on your laptop and go have fun with it. Um, and, you know, so I think the cultural part has been really holding back big tech. Uh, yeah. And by the way, I think you mentioned Copilot. You know, Copilot is an amazing example. I think it's the credit of one person, uh, our mutual friend, uh, one Nat Friedman, who was basically able to overcome, uh, you know, probably a lot of internal bureaucracy and basically say, hey, you know what, like this is going to go crawl every bit of code on GitHub and we're going to make it. And I think by the way, Copilot, I think this is an amazing start, which is, I think, like a, a very significant percentage of all code now written uh, in 
visual studio code is now with our co-pilot but but i do like uh, so um as i agree with that but i think alex what you're trying to say is uh it's not that the big companies are, not, are sleeping at the wheel right now you know they a lot of the small incumbents like the new startups come in and uh, they're able to innovate really quickly and build and proliferate and just take ai and apply to very interesting super different use cases like that to me and we should talk about like what are like your favorite use cases too um that is super exciting to see but i guess what you're trying to say is like uh the big companies are also adapting pretty quickly now and mm-hmm. it's like getting that that cycles getting that windows getting shorter which i think is like net positive because uh you know a lot of folks look to big companies for validation on whether this is a serious field or this is an area that they should go work in or get mm-hmm. jobs in that kind of thing so i generally net net competition is good and i'm excited to kind of see the entire industry is just moving forward with the adoption yeah but by the way i so which i think that leads me to an interesting point which is from the startup versus big company i think there's a historical idea that look the way you build a moat in ai is you raise a lot of money or you have a lot of money you get a lot of gpus and you train these larger and larger models but now i think in november 2022 i think there's a discussion which is where is the moat is it in the models or is it in the app layer mm. um because on the model side one could make an argument that a the lot of models out there and this is becoming maybe a bit of a commodity b is going to cost you a few hundred million dollars to go raise a model which sounds crazy but it's not outside the boundaries of like a capital fundraise that one could do mm-hmm. but this is anyway so i'm kind of curious to get your take on models app layer you know where does a strategic moat exist Yeah this is this is the this is the key question. I think I think um and here I think you kind of go back to the basics. I think one thing that that's been shown and I think s- stable diffusion is really the the sort of like um the 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 case to hold up here is that the model is not a moat. You know, I think there was this you know you maybe um two or three years ago you you might have believed like hey if you built the model and you owned the know-how around how to build that model um you have a moat and that's going to be captive technology that that you alone have and um and the reality is that that's just not true um people figure out how to build these models because they're just so cool um the the sort of ideas aren't that novel aren't that um uh aren't that tricky and so you know we build um in open source you can build just as good of models and then they end up uh going out to the entire community so i think i think the models really aren't the moat um and i think if you if you go back to first principles of 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 business the customer relationship and the user relationship is always where value will accrue in the long term um and uh and so i think you know i think the app layer in particular the the front ends and the uis that that people use and the brands that people associate with the ai technology are going to continue to be where where there's where there's moats over time because there's just this intangible value of of owning that customer relationship um it's it's very interesting because it's very counter culture it's like counter to a lot of the the narrative as of late in technology which is um if you look at the most successful or most iconic tech companies of of maybe the past 5 years it's companies like AWS and Stripe these sort of like boring back end infrastructure right. um right. Uh, players but yeah. uh but i sorry, think we're going to go and andy jassy yeah <laughs> sorry about that they i think they love to be called boring they they uh they 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 uh embrace it but i think that the um the story of the the next decade is going to be much more about sort of um you know front front end user value and and owning that customer relationship right. kind of as it was maybe uh t- two decades ago So if it's uh the application layer I'm just curious to get your take what are some unique or interesting monetization models for these applications uh when it comes to AI Yeah I think a lot of the if you look at a lot of the tools that have done super well you know think about like the Jaspers or the Midjourneys or um or 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 what not like a lot of them sell directly to the user um yeah. and and it's sort of it's it's all up through these like bottoms up motions much in the same way that like a notion or a or an air table or a figma you know these products grew um so i think you know that's it's kind of like a keep it simple kind of thing like these are the, <laughs> these are known well uh, good good business models um 
I think there's these interesting uh, business models and we've been experimenting with this is like, how can you do ROI based business models for, for big businesses? You yeah. know, cause, um, cause a lot of the, the nuance of AI is that, you know, it just gets better and better with more data. So mm-hmm. um, you really want like as much as possible, you want enterprise wide deployments of the technology because that's how you're going to get the maximal ROI from the technology. And there's, mm-hmm. wor- there's like use cases where, AI can literally make a company like billions and billions of more dollars. And the, mm. and the big tech companies know this, obviously, because they've been deploying AI at scale and have been making billions and billions of dollars from better algorithms. But but most enterprises don't have like really don't know about this or have, or have no idea. And so um, a lot of what we've been looking at is like, how can you do ROI based business models for large scale deployments such that the businesses, they don't feel like they're risking too much. Um, but they also get, you know, if it ends up generating billions and billions of dollars of value, that there's sort of some some suitable sort of value exchange. You mentioned generative AI a little bit earlier. I'm kind of curious to just dig into that on the consumer side. So, you know, everyone's written a DALI or a, you know, stable efficient prompt, um, lots of interesting new apps, which use images as input. I think uh, TikTok has released one, Facebook has had demos of one. What, where do you see image generation, video generation in say next two, three years? Yeah, I mean, I think the A, the models are gonna keep getting better. So all the like weird issues and, and weirdnesses that you see in the models, I think that there's so much force in the in the community, like we're just gonna fix all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, the video generation stuff is super interesting because I think it's, um, that A, it's coming, you know, you know, pretty soon, we're just gonna all have like little prompts where we can generate our own gifts from scratch. And, right. um, and it's a super interesting technology because, you know, it'll, it'll allow you to create almost like full scenes, um, using, using, uh, AI generation, you know, it won't let you create a whole movie just with one line, but it'll let you create like, mm-hmm. Hey, like this guy should go pick up a, a water yeah. bottle over there yeah. and then hand it to his friend or whatnot. And so, um, you're going to start seeing, well, a, I think, uh, it's going to be really cool technology, but it's going to dramatically reduce the cost of content creation um, mm. in a way that is, is I think it's going to be incredibly interesting, just in the same way that, you know, it, if you think about what TikTok did for content ecosystems, mm. it, um, it made it such that so many more people could become like pretty reasonable content creators. Content creators um, yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, I think many people uh, felt this way about TikTok, uh, the vibrancy and creativity of that ecosystem was just greater than anything else that had come before it. Mm-hmm. And I think you're going to see that happen, you know, almost like a 10x effect. I don't know what platform it's going to be on, but on on some set of platforms, we're just going to see way more creative content and we're going to mm-hmm. like it's going to be such a more such a more vibrant ecosystem. And I think we as right. the sort of consumers of that content are going to be massively rewarded mm-hmm. with, you know, these like these infinitely creative videos that take somebody like you know, an hour to make by stitching together different AI tools. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think when Imad showed up on our show too, he mentioned the same thing. We come from India and Bollywood's a huge industry. And he talked about how um, a big chunk of movie making in the future could potentially just be done through AI, you know, like full scenes, full video generations. That's super exciting. If you think about it from like, you know, cost standpoint, it makes it like lower to it's basically makes the process so democratic, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, a- anyone can be a movie maker, a creator. Uh, I, I just think the possibilities there are like yeah. really neat. I, I think about also, it may not be full movies, but think about three visualizations, storyboarding. Totally. Yeah. Um, we already have, you know, people living in the Unreal Engine dome to mm-hmm. create CGI. So you can easily imagine like, like all of prototyping kind of uh, yeah, pr- I mean, having the next MCU movie totally prototype and pre vised and without the actors and you almost get a near final version, like an MVP for a movie. I think that's like within like the next year or two. Yeah. I want to get back yeah. to the creators part because one really hot topic is the idea of royalty rights, mm. credit attribution, um, and, you know, and this kind of come up in a few places. One is we mentioned Copilot and there's been all these questions about, hey, you know, my code was used in ways which my license are. Now, that seems like a technical problem that can be solved, right? You scrape the license, whatever. I feel like those things, are, you know, with, which, the more, which can be fixed. The more interesting problem is, hey, I'm an artist. 
I took this gorgeous photo of a bridge. And now I can tell that that photo has, you know, as is a key input when you try and generate a bridge out of Dolly or stable diffusion, but I'm not making any money from it. I'm not getting any credit for it. Uh, and there are multiple schools of thoughts on how to address it uh, or not address it. Kind of curious about how you think of the whole situation. Yeah, I think a, so. This is an exciting example where I think there are a bunch of startups thinking a lot about this. And I think that, that um, I'm excited to see what solutions come out of that ecosystem. I think fundamentally, um, there needs to be there need to be ways for you to somehow participate in the upside of the use of your your IP in these algorithms. Because, you know, on in some level, these algorithms are sort of like these um these like IP, uh, you know, um, melting pots where they just <laughs> pull together all the IP. And then, you know, so if you look at all the all the like best prompts that that people use, they always you, know, you actually you always name certain artists um, specifically by name in those prompts, mm -hmm. because that's how you get the best outputs. It's like you're 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 telling the model to specifically replicate. Um, you know, the style of these artists or, or, or um, their, their sort of like unique style. And so this is actually one area where I think the open sourcing has really hurt us because I think, you know, because Stable Diffusion was open source and, and it sort of like raced ahead, we, this topic um, is very hard to actually control at this point. Um, it's hard to, uh, it's hard, at least at the tech layer, it's hard to say, oh, you'll only use, um, at the technology layer, if you use a certain artist name in the prompt, then you know maybe there's some royalty that gets paid to the paid to the user, et cetera. Um, but I think that this is a point where I think um, you know we need to develop the right frameworks that actually give attribution and give credit where credit's due and allow these artists to participate in the upside. And I think that you know um, I think a lot of the best platforms are going to do right on this yeah. on this topic. You know, I think that I, I, I actually think this is placed by crypto is actually going to play a role because one of the things crypto is very good at is, you know, you know, storing things forever um, and uh, in a way which anyone can reference. And um, we have seen some companies, which, you know, in very, very early days of this, which is, hey, how do you know, you know, how do you kind of track credit attribution all the way from here to there? And if you look at, say, like the NFT ecosystem mm -hmm. in uh, Web3, uh, as <laughs> God intended and not how <laughs> Alex Wang intends, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 the OG Web3. Uh, but one of the things, like, if you look at the world of NFTs, they have really figured out royalties, right? Like, which is if you use this NFT five steps down the road, you know, here are all the people, how they get it. And look, there are so many. Or, or basically when it switches hands, when you, when resale of NFTs or when it transfers down. When it switches hands or, you know, when it's used in particular ways. I do think to a lot of the one part I would maybe differ with you is I actually think technology is probably the wrong layer to enforce these things. A lot of things are enforced, I would say, in social, cultural, like context. Like, you know, so for example, right, you know, I could copy paste, you know, something you send me and then say, I take credit for it, but I'll just be a total jerk if I do that, right? So, or, you know, I, and a lot of these cases I would get sued. And I think it's the legal, social context of things uh, where a lot of these will uh, get solved. Now, I mean, one. Thing I, I, I don't know about that. I. I, okay, all right. <laughs> I actually think Alex is right. I think uh, the when you say legal slash social context, legal context is the financial context of like uh, you know applying technology in a way where it is like monetary incentives are aligned mm -hmm. to the creator, right? Like social context, you can you you can sure you can shame people into saying, well, don't copy my work. But at the end of the day, the pro that's not the problem. The problem that you're trying to solve is. I created something. Am I getting paid for the work that you created based off of my work, right? And the derivatives idea and just building monetization frameworks mm -hmm. on top of it. I do think. I think Alex is right. I, I'm. It's, it's a technology problem. We have to build the right framework to figure out who gets credit and credit in the sense of who gets paid yep. for the work that is uh, newly generated based off of an existing uh, work yeah. of art. Yeah, I think. The Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way, right? I, I think both of you are right. I think the challenging part historically has been holding back technology until something is figured out. Because I think if you do, somebody else figures out. But I guess you know, this kind of leads into slightly tan slightly related but interesting topics. So um, ethics and AI, right? So, you know, and, you know, you, you mentioned open AI. 
they famously have a, you know a lot of restrictions on what you can and can't do or often i would say you know so one of the some of the reasons why they choose not to publish their work is because they want to actually sort of control how it can be used um ema stable diffusion obviously they, the other end of the spectrum. yeah they have a very different school of thought how do you where do you stand on that yeah you know i think um i think there's i think the reality is that on some level these topics are going to have to be governed through regulation and policy and laws and and um and that will be done by you know country by country let's say based off the the governing bodies of those countries and i think at the end of the day i i think that you know both uh both camps are a little wrong in that there is rule of law <laughs> in most of the <laughs> in most places in the world and i don't think it should be dictated by the creators of the technology so i don't think that you know in open ai or google uh, or facebook should be dictating and gatekeeping this technology cuz uh a lot of times i don't think they're you know a they're not thoughtful enough about a lot of the policy issues but b they're not held accountable by the people of america you know that that's right. kind of the more right. fundamental issue um or the people of whatever jurisdiction that that they operate in and then all the way on the other hand you know of the sort of like laissez faire get this technology out there and and let everyone use it i think there's that's problematic too i mean there's just like simple clear things you know the internet is a great example of this like there's a lot of bad stuff on the internet and that needs to be regulated and and there needs to be law to prevent bad stuff to, from happening on the internet this is the same thing we need to we need laws to prevent you know horrible but behavior. i guess from that standpoint right like the laissez faire approach part of the appeal is that you know why should a few big companies that have a very specific context and the work in this like sort of a local maxima dictate the rules for everybody else and and i think a part of the conversation which i think resonates with a lot of people is cultural context like you know if i come from a different country why should a google or a facebook tell me what is acceptable with like how i use ai mm-hmm. in in my country in my religion like you know that's kind of where the conversation kind of falls apart with these like extreme approaches so it's not so much laissez faire for the sake of being like you know get it out the door and be quick about it and people will figure it out it's also about like how do we truly empower people to make their own choices and give them the right framework to think about AI for my country, AI for my community of people, that kind of yep. thing. Well, yeah, no, I so I actually I agree with everything you're saying. I think there's like there's two main things. There's um the sort of like access to technology, which I think the access to technology should be as broad and wide ranging as possible because I think okay. people, you know, as with any technology, it should be globalized and democratized as quickly as possible to everyone in the world. And then there's the second piece which is what do we say? What do we as a society say are the good and bad use cases of of artificial intelligence right. like should mm-hmm. i be allowed to use ai to create a an ai impersonator of of shri ram and then create my own good time show um <laughs> i i don't think <laughs> well, if they can drive us subscriptions you know i would say go for it <laughs> <laughs> there are times when arty might prefer, prefer that too right like somebody who interrupts people less <laughs> um but but yeah so then i think there's these questions around like what are the good and bad use cases of the technology and i think just like with any technology we can't just let it be like run wild everywhere we need to we need to have rule of law we need to have regulation we need to have laws that dictate mm-hmm. what the technology is is good and bad for and i think a lot of people in silicon valley and the tech community they like get really afraid when you say the word regulation and policy mm-hmm. and, and and law cuz it's just sort right. of it sound it's nebulous it always sounds, sounds bad it sounds scary yeah. sounds mm-hmm. constraining um but it's 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 necessary in any new technology and um i know it's hard for you know especially in america recently for us to trust our policy makers and and the folks uh making uh making these decisions in dc but on some level that is that is the accountability mechanism of the country you know we as citizens of of america to ensure the sort of collective good of of America we elect officials who help make these decisions who who hopefully drive forward the the intent mm-hmm. of the nation so um basically long story short i believe in america and its institutions um i don't believe the technology should be gatekept i also don't think it should run wild oh. <laughs> uh, okay i want to switch gears a little bit you know one of the things i always love about you is you're one of the most thoughtful people about how a company and a ceo should work 
and you know and how systems are built uh and actually you have a fantastic substack which i'm going to go into just a bit but could you tell us like you know what is a week of your time look like how do you spend it how do you prioritize what is a week in the life of alex look like yeah it's it's a it's a really good question i think that the um the uh i i uh well i'll start with simple things um most more recently i've been starting to wake up really early um uh usually somewhere between 5 and 6 a.m. and um the first reason i did this was just cuz and, and by the way i know a lot of parents wake up really early as well and so it's sort of um this is like a i'm not a parent but it's kind of a new realization for me and um First is because I just was always jet lagged coming back from Europe. And then it like, you know, I could never fix my sleeping schedule. And so I just wake up really early. And then um, I find the mornings are the best time to do deep thinking. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's it was one of these things I in the in sort of the middle of the startup journey, I ended up um, being constantly overbooked meeting wise and not having any time to do deep thinking. And um, it really holds you back. And it's sort of right. one of these things that's like, tough to fully appreciate because you deep thinking in the morning. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, I, I love to spend time. I think this job is maybe an extrovert. I love to spend time with customers. I love to spend time with people in the company. Um, I love to spend time with, with people I'm trying to recruit. And, uh, and I basically try to like do as much of all those things as possible. Maybe roughly a third, a third, a third, you know, talk to our customers, talk to, um, the, like my incredible teammates, talk to, um, uh, talk to people who I'm trying to like bring on to the bring on to the mission. And in all of that time, one of the things that I really try to do is learn as much as I can from all of those interactions. So there's sort of, I think it's like one really, um, there's something that I think a lot of, a lot of, whether it's founders or executives or engineers, you know, at a certain point, they stop making learning like a deep priority for themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and so they sort of end up you know, a lot of times I think it's when you get to a certain point of seniority and you're like, oh, I, I'm like, I'm pretty accomplished and I, I've done a lot of good stuff. And so now I'm just like in executing mode. But I think, you know, you have to always take this mindset where it's like, how do I learn as much as possible from every interaction with 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 um, with somebody? And how do I learn more about how they think? How do I learn more about what they're really amazing at? How do I learn more about um, how they think about their industry, how do I learn more about their problem set? Um, and so that's one of the things I, I really try to try to walk away from um, walk away from all these interactions. Um, and then I think it's important to take be able to take steps back and reflect on reflect on all of this, um, reflect on everything that you're sort of digesting. I think that one one mental model I have is that um, I have this incredible uh, this sort of like I'm very lucky to be able to talk to brilliant people all day every day and then, um, the sort of like collective wisdom from all of these people I get to meet with, there's like mm-hmm. such incredible nuggets uh, within all of that, that um, it's my job to sort of implement and, and take those and actually allows us, allow those to shape how we, uh, how we build scale. Um, okay, so I want to jump into one part about how we build scale, which is betting on unknown unknowns. And we're going to drop probably a link in the, the description below, but there's actually a post on your sub stack. But what does that mean for you? Yeah, so I think that, um, one of the things that, that, uh, you know, always felt really, um, confusing to me, it, confusing, I think is the right word is that, um, you know, there's so much, especially as, as we've scaled and we've become like a, a bigger and bigger company, there's so much time spent thinking very specifically about like, what are all the things that you can predict and how are all those things going to play out and how can you get so good at predicting all of these very uh, these 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 events, and so for example, most public companies they're they're really judged on um, their earnings, and so they have to like you know forecast for their revenue very accurately. If you forecast poorly, you get dinged by the public markets very aggressively, and and so there's so much effort spent into this process of producing predictability, for lack of a better word. And then you look at you look at the most innovative companies, or you look at the most innovative organizations, and the reality is that some way or another, they stumble on these incredible opportunities that were totally unexpected and um, and make everything, in some sense, totally unpredictable, but are that's like the, the core of what makes humans and innovation incredibly exciting. So one of the examples I talk about in this post is, is um, AWS and Amazon. You know, you could have you could have written one story of Amazon, which was just as a as a retailer, 
uh, an e-retailer, so an e-commerce company. Um, and uh, and uh, it would have been totally impossible to predict AWS. You know, it's it's this total left shark mm-hmm. move. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I often think that like um, the fact that Amazon built AWS, it's almost like a bad screenwriter wrote that yeah. in a TV show. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, it's like somebody who doesn't understand technology at all is like, oh yeah, you had this like, um, you had this tech company that sold things to people, and then they um, they built a, a data center business. You're like, what? What? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they did it, and and uh, and it would have been impossible to have to have said have said anything about Amazon. Um, you know, Amazon is what it is now because of AWS, yeah. and so this sort of like core concept, this sort of dissonance between. You know, we want to feel like we can, like, we're going to know all the steps on how things are going to happen in the future. And we, like, force ourselves to, like, feel like this is all very on the rails and predictable. But in reality, if you look at the history of humanity, it's totally unpredictable. And you have to bet on, you know, unknown unknowns or bet on things that are are nonlinear happening in the future. The other the other best example of this um, is, is Moore's Law, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, way back when, uh, Moore basically, you know, came up with this arbitrary rule that, uh, hey, at first it was every year, and then then it was every two years. Every two years, the number of transistors uh, is going to double, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's a very arbitrary rule. And there's no way he had any idea, not only how long we're going to keep it up, but like how we're going to get there. But then the sort of the human innovation and ingenuity engine uh, was able to, you know. Uh, believe it or not, every year, every two years, come up with a new innovation that allowed us to keep whittling away and whittling away and whittling away. So I think at the end of the day, it's sort, it's sort of like, I think as humanity, we, we got to bet on innovation and we have to bet on bet on our ingenuity. And um, I, uh, it's, it's, um, it's weird that we don't, um, most people don't think this way. Most people don't bet on humanity. Most people don't bet on the fact that we're going to devise new solutions to hard problems. I think something which is very related is one of your other posts, which is uh, lazy versus active thinking. Because I think something underlying one thing you said is trying to actually think about how the world is going to play out into some sort of a thesis. And, you know, trying to put maybe some expected value, like some expected, uh, you know, probability of it happening. Could you describe like what active versus like lazy thinking means and making bets on the future? Yeah, active versus lazy thinking, it's so interesting. You know, you kind of like, um, uh, one of the things that, um, that, that I always find really interesting is that, um, you know, it's, it's maybe one way to put it is like, a lot of times it's easy to sound smart. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and we, we do it on every show. <laughs> um, and, and you, you meet a lot of people, you know, people in the tech industry are very smart overall. And, and so a lot of people can sound like sound really, really smart. And then, but then, um, what you notice is that, especially as organizations get bigger, mm-hmm. there's this effect where it's people who sound the smartest, who maybe they're, we go with their opinions, but that may or may not be actually connected with the on the ground reality. Yeah. And um, e- everyone in big organizations has seen this happen. And and it's like, you know, sometimes it's but, like- But how do you question. counter that? Because you're, you know, as somebody from the outside, you're looking for signals, right? And uh, voice and clarity of thought uh, and speech is a signal. Uh, mm-hmm. And so almost all, and I agree with you, by the way, I think uh, it is kind of a disservice to people who are like particularly introverted, who don't really speak up, but- are brilliant and they just want to do the best work yeah. and are creative. How do you how do you counter that? Well, can I just say, by the way, if you want to sound smart in a big company, you know what I'm saying? Somebody will go, look for a second. Let's look at the bigger picture here, <laughs> right? Like, what should be our broad strategy? Let's focus on strategy, okay? And uh, 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 and you know, and th- you, you start the sentence. I'm like, oh my god, like you know, like uh, uh, nothing hearing. torpedoes a productive meeting like that. Uh. You know, you just like take a big, <laughs> like, take a step back and think about the big things, and then you're like, okay, this, uh, I, this I, meeting's I, done. I heard a story uh, that Bill Gates in reviews. If somebody says one of these platitudes, he absolutely nukes him. Uh, you know, uh, which is like, let's look at the big, bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Like no, you but, know, yeah, um, anyway. but. But uh, Alex, like serious question though, how do you find like signals then? And how, how, how does, how do you find signal from the noise? With the big picture. (laughs) 
Yeah. And so this this idea of of, of active versus lazy thinking, it, it's really all around how do you, you know, the thing that you're looking for is two things. You're looking for verifiable statements. So mm-hmm. for one of the things that you, you just talked about, like saying, let's look at a big picture. Let's talk about our strategy. Our strategy should be X. It's such an unverifiable statement to mm-hmm. like these broad sweeping claims. There's like actually no way. Let's say I say that like, hey, I think scale, you know, really what we need to become is the the um, uh, the like leader in AI pets or whatever. It's like it's like these like big statements. They're impossible to verify. And it just, you know, everyone can have an opinion, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but forcing the organization and forcing, you know, everyone you're with to sort of like say very verifiable things. So, hey, mm-hmm. scale, um, you know, there's a uh, X billion dollar opportunity in AI and pets mm-hmm. over the next three years. Um, and and we have we have an interesting way to to, mm-hmm. to build into that because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so A, forcing sort of like verifiable statements and then forcing and then really like digging in like, okay, why do you believe that? What are the data points? And forcing this like level of verification, um, mm-hmm. maybe one way to put it. I think another way to kind of think about this is like in most human conversation and human interactions, there is too little verification. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of hyperbole and just talking about and and I think some of it I think is also like uh, we've sp- we think of it as like cultural difference. Uh, when we first came to the U.S., we were like astonished that everybody would be like everything was superlatives, right? Like it's amazing, things are wonderful, and I'm like, how could that be? Like I would like walk around, like go to the supermarket, I'm like, how's your day? And they'd be like, amazing, and you're like, wow, like that's. That's great. Like, how could you possibly have a great day every single day? Um, and you realize some of it is also like the cultural context not translating. And yeah. and to your yeah. point, it's also it's kind of hard to measure within companies on like what does that mean or how can you verify this? What is and I'm I'm very left brained in my thinking too, and mm-hmm. so it's it's. I, uh, I always have trouble there. There's a great book called The Culture Code, which plots uh, various global cultures on an axis. And I think it's actually company cultures could be plotted similarly. So, for example, and this kind of stereotyping all these countries because, you know, people are obviously very different. But, you know, the, in terms of high context countries like, you know, Japan, right. you know, India is one. There is a lot of symbolism. There is a lot of things which are unsaid. You know, how you sit in a room, how you approach, say, a senior person mm. on, um, a, 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 or no, sorry, not high context, like, you know, uh, a, a high trust. But in the other side of the spectrum, if you have, like, I think the stereotypical Israeli companies, for example, right? Like, I love working with folks in Israel because they'll be like, yeah, you're full of shit. And, and they're going to tell you, like, you know, exactly mm-hmm. what, what they mean. So, you know, by the way, they, they know, they're going to tell you exactly the full picture. And that is not like a lot of subtext that you are uh, missing. So, I think, and I've seen this with companies too, mm. by the way. Um, you know, I remember like way, way back uh, when we used to work in India and we used to work, uh, when Microsoft India used to work with Microsoft in the US, there'd be these huge cultural clashes, right? Because the, the, the folks in India would, would not want to ever say no. Um, and the folks in the US would actually think, well, if you think you want to deliver something, we actually think you want to deliver something. And you get these amazing cultural clashes uh, uh, going on. But I really love what you said about having these verifiable facts to back things up. It's kind of similar to, for example, like what the Amazon PR FAQ like, system does in some way and building some sort of a logic tree to make arguments on. Right. Yeah. And I think the other piece that uh, relatedly um, that what you were saying made me think of is that um, you actually, uh, th- this is very true in in my culture, in my family, this is where I grew up. Like I I like it when people challenge my th- beliefs yes, because yeah. it causes me to grow and it causes me to, to like be, be more thoughtful and be more correct and all this stuff. And, um, and that's, that's not culturally universal. This sort of like, you know, it's not culturally universal. People like being challenged, but right. um, it's very healthy for an organization because I think that one of the issues is that um, at a certain point, if organizations are going more off of gut feel, than then um, based off of the, the sort of, uh, data and 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 facts that they're getting on like on the ground, then that's where stuff starts going. Oh, really totally, high. totally, totally. I kind of see this as like a workout for the mind, right? Like uh-huh. you kind of like how you get pushed physically when you work out. You want to have a similar kind of a mental exercise for like being challenged, so mm-hmm. that it lets you develop, it lets you grow, it lets you build muscle. In organizations, the problem I've seen is not so much like going with gut feel. But it's more about one person states something 
And then everybody else, because of whatever reason, like this person's like in a senior position or in a position of authority, is my manager, whatever could be the reason, they would just like refuse to push back. But the oftentimes that exec or that senior person doesn't even know that, you know, they're, they don't actually agree with it, but they don't want to push back. And so it just becomes this like, this weird situation of like emperor's new clothes where yeah. nobody ever states anything and you're just walking around being like, I don't agree with it, but I'm not yeah. going to say anything. And they just like uh, keep going. And I think this especially becomes hard when you get successful, right? Like, you know, because I've seen, um, you know, like some, some of the most famous people in technology who are incredibly wealthy and over time, you know, the people who surround them are so used to being just agreeing with them. Mm. Um, um, and also by this kind of human impulse, right? If somebody's like, you know, just going to disagree with you all the time, over time, you just kind of like subconsciously maybe don't like them, um, but they're not getting the intellectually honest answer. So how do you think about that? I mean, you are obviously successful and, you know, well-known and, when, and a lot of people are going to join your company, you know, may not know you as well. How do you think about, okay, your leadership team, people in the company are going to give an honest opinion as opposed to, hey, Alex said this is X, so let's just agree with him and tell him his idea is amazing. Yeah, you know, one thing I tell people is like, if you're not, um, if you're not disagreeing with me and you're not telling me like you're not calling me out, then I uh, I trust you less because <laughs> you know you I like um uh even with even with the most like minded people in the world, I find that I disagree with them, you know, at least like ten percent of the time, right? <laughs> and so um. And so no matter what, and, and, you know, within a company, you have a more, you have a pretty diverse set of, of perspectives and pretty diverse set of, of, of past backgrounds. And so, um, the, I, I think I, it's, it's kind of like in poker, you know, you kind of like try to like get a, get a gut sense for like, you know, yeah. how much are people bluffing, how much, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, it's kind of similar where it's like, I, I really want people to disagree with me and, you know, organizations at some point, you know, you need people to disagree and commit. And I think that that concept from, uh, I think Amazon may have been the originator, but it's just so correct and so um, so thoughtful. But you really need, like I invite uh, disagreement in meetings. I'm like, hey, nobody's saying anything right now. I don't, I think that this is at least somewhat controversial. Like I'm going to go around, like all of you have to say how much you agree with, with this on a scale of one yeah. to 10. Um, yeah. I think yeah. forcing yeah. conversation too is, uh, is, it's kind of, you know, the first time you do it, it's kind of awkward and then and then people get used to it and like, yeah, you know, I, I, sh I probably should say. How yeah, I think it also comes down to building a safety infrastructure, like safety net for the team and for the people to be able to disagree without repercussions. I think mm -hmm. that's I think every company, every team should think about that actively, uh, because oftentimes you'd be like. I've noticed how you like do this exercise and you can like, no ideas are bad ideas. Take a piece of post-it and put it on the wall and you'd get like these amazing ideas. But when you'd ask around in the meeting room, people would be like, I don't want to say anything. Yeah. And so it's, it's about the sense of uh, what would people think of me if I say this and uh, uh, what will I get punished in whatever yeah. way? And I think if you remove those as like constraints, uh, I think, you know, good things happen yeah. there. I think the moral of the story, Alex, is there is somebody in your company, a crypto <laughs> nerd, who when you first said that Web3 comment was like, oh, hold on a second, God. Alex. <laughs> like that is only one Web3, right? And, you know, <laughs> and, and, but they're like, I don't know, you know, Alex is going for it, but he's so wrong. So find that person because that guy or girl or whoever, but, you know, yeah, you want to promote that person right there. Um, Alex, uh, you know, you've been with, uh, you know, you've been here for a while now. It's been over an hour. This has been such a fun conversation. And also we've like, I'm really glad we also branched out from, you know, your story, the AI and all of that into like company building culture, all of that. I think all of it is really important. One question we often get, you know, a lot of our audience are people who are founders or aspiring to be founders. And then, so I wanted to, you know, try and wrap uh, with this one last question for people who are aspiring to be founders or people who are founders, what advice do you have for them? You know, I think um, it's, uh, I think there's a few things. I think the first is to really brace yourself for a wild ride. You know, you, you know this as well, um, but it, it is, um, <laughs> it is one of the most intense prolonged experiences that you can possibly have as a human. And so it's, it's, um, uh, and you just need to be prepared for it because of the sort of the level of responsibility, the, the like kinds of problems that will pop up, the sort of um, constant problem solving required, the sort of like 
comfort with a a constant level of of meaningful dysfunction. You know, all these things are, um, you know, you just have you just have to be prepared for them, and you have to have a support network um, of yeah. of people who who are going to be there for you. For me, like my family has been really um, critical through the through through the whole process of of building scale. Um, so that I think that's sort of like the first disclaimer that's really important. I think the second disclaimer is that um, you know. Uh, it's a long journey. Uh, you have to be committed to it and you have to be ready to do it for, you know, a decade at least. And, um, and I think it's very rare other than getting married to somebody that, that, um, that, or, or having children that humans make, uh, commitments on that time scale. Mm. And, uh, and uh, so it's, it's a big, it's a big life choice, but, you know, disclaimers aside, I think that the, um, the, the main thing is to sort of, um, as a, as a founder, don't be too dogmatic. I think that the, the, you know, it, it's a, it's kind of an unintuitive thing because of Steve jobs um, and his sort of school of thought, which is actually, and, and is extremely dogmatic. And Steve jobs is sort of like very, you know, he had like strong views and then he sort of like willed those into the world. Um, I really don't think that's the way that that uh, most founders are going to be successful or, and I think that archetype is pretty wrong. I think it's very important to sort of um, really constantly be like, uh, kind of, as I mentioned, learning, understanding the facts on the ground, understanding what people are telling you and then constantly adapting based mm -hmm. off of that. And I think that that is, um, that's sort of the, this like core learning cycle is, is fundamental to the process of, of, um, of being able to be successful over long periods of time. I love that. I mean, it's also, it, it's, we often say this, right? Like not everybody can be Steve Jobs. Like you don't have to try and be him from like from personality and how decisions are made and that kind of thing. You have to find your own style and you have to figure out what works for you, what your strengths are. Um, I love that because it's, it's, it's not meant to be controversial, but it somehow is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I think also the commitment part, this is a long journey. I mean, when we, for example, when at a 16 z when we think about a lot of the companies we partner with, it's been for a decade or close to a decade. So, and you know, and probably for many more years. So, it's a very long journey. But on that note, uh, yeah, Alex, this was great fun. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, we we sometimes say you know that a guest who came to play and Mr. Alex Web three o <laughs> Bang definitely uh, 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 came to play. But Alex, such a genuine pleasure. Uh, you're awesome. And, you know, uh, we should do this again sometime. But uh, yeah. this is great. Yeah, we'd love to. This is a lot of fun. Uh, oh, man. Always... Thank you so much, Alex. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, The Good Time Show by Aarti and Shreya.